pray this morning that nothing or no one has stolen your joy. So get those faces a little bit more smiling and be glad that you're in the house of the Lord. If you're visiting this morning, we're certainly glad that you've taken time out of your schedule. We know your, your time is important and we're glad that you've chosen to be with us in spirit and in truth this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior. When you came in, you should have received an order of worship. It looks like this. Inside, there's a little flap. It says welcome, and it also has prayer request. If you will fill that out and put it in the offering box on your way out, we would certainly appreciate it. We're so thankful that you are here today, and we know that God is going to honor and bless our time together. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Say that with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you today for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and for the opportunity that is ours to worship you in spirit and in truth. It is our prayer that our effort would honor you as the Savior of our, of our lives. And Father, we pray if there's one here today that is struggling, that they would turn those struggles, those uncertainties over to you and allow you to work in and through their lives. This is your time. We pray that we would be about worshiping you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, church, let's sing about nothing that I desire compares with you. Shout to the Lord. Let's stand together as we sing. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. My Jesus, my Savior. My Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my comfort.
you may have to put on your thinking caps today. And you might have to recall something that happened maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago, or it might have happened last week. Have you ever done something that you knew was wrong, but because somebody wanted you to do it or because a friend told you to do it, you did it anyway? I've done that, and everybody out here has as well. When I was, I would, I would probably say probably Benjamin, maybe Andrew's age, I had a friend by the name of Bruce, and I was at his house, and he came up with a good idea, or so it seemed at the time. He said, let's go to the backyard and start a fire. And I knew I wasn't supposed to play with matches. I knew that I probably wasn't supposed to start a fire. And so we went outside and we gathered all these leaves. It was right outside of his mom and dad's bedroom. They had one of those sliding glass doors that they could go out on the little patio. So we were past the patio, pretty safe from the house, I would, thought, I would have thought. And uh, we, we lit a fire. And about five minutes into that fire, uh, Bruce's uncle came around the corner and he asked us, hey, what, what are y'all doing? And he got a garden hose and he put out the fire and said, you guys know better. Now, Miss Barbara was Bruce's mother. And I don't know why, but she felt compelled to call my parents <laughs> and to tell them about this experience. Now, when I got home, my dad lit another fire. <laughs> that fire wasn't a physical fire. That fire was lighting me up. I think he spanked me about as hard as he's ever spanked me. And uh, he said, don't do that again. I, I got to tell you, I never did it again. But I did allow the crowd later on or other people to influence me in things that I shouldn't do or shouldn't have done. Now, when you're at school, you're going to have people that are going to ask you they're going to ask you to do things or they're going to pressure you to do things. One thing that you can do is what Joshua has on his wrist right here. It's not just a decorative bracelet. It says WWJD. And that doesn't stand what would Joshua do. That stands for what would Jesus do. And sometimes we can save ourselves a lot of trouble, save our parents a lot of effort, if we would just think before we do or think before we say things. Because when we don't, we allow the world to influence us more than God. And that should never be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that your voice still calls to us. Your voice, Heavenly Father, entreats us to follow you. And I pray for these children. I pray that they would understand that you want what is best for their lives. I pray for our adults too, that they would understand this. And Father, I just ask that you would continue to speak and we would continue to listen. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship this morning.
When I said that I would follow, it was with an honest heart. But I didn't fully understand the cost. Cause there are saints throughout the ages, and there are those today who understand what it really means to carry the cross that only fuels my devotion no matter what comes I will say yes I believe I believe with all that is in me yes I believe though the world rises up against me I will be faithful to the choice I have made I am determined I will not be ashamed to live so the whole world can see that yes I believe there will never be confidence for I have found where my assurance lies it is not in my own power but in who my Savior is and the truth of this conviction makes me shout to the sky yes I believe I believe with all that is in me choice I have made. I am determined I will not be ashamed to live so the whole world can see that yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. He is risen. Yes, I sing the phone book. They could sing the, you know, the phone book and we would be just as inspired and just as moved. Let me encourage you this morning to open up your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, the second chapter, and then we're going to be looking over in the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew the 13th chapter. As I look at our, our world today and, and even in our churches, one of the things that I am seeing 
is that many of you are losing your joy. You're losing your joy. There are times that you're happy. There are times that you're up. But there are also times that you're down. And when you start losing your joy, you've lost everything that the Christian faith is about. And you say, well, pastor, you need to understand what's, what's going on in this world. Oh, I understand. I understand completely. But I also know greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And you need to understand that as you worship this morning, there needs to be a sense of excitement. There needs to be a sense of joy that comes with being with God's people. But at the top of the list of people who are living a defeated life today are the children of God. We're so downcast. We're so upset. And we feel as though there's no hope. So today, we want to look at the joy that comes along with our faith and understand to have that joy, it will be worth whatever it costs you. And it will cost you dearly. Let's honor the reading of God's word as we look in Proverbs 2, 1 through 8. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turn in your ear to wisdom and apply in your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and call and cry out loud for understanding, and if you will look for it as silver and search for it, as in a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just. He protects the way of his faithful ones. And now let's look in Matthew 13. Beginning in verse 44. Two quick parables. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he went and sold everything that he had and purchased the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking at pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had and bought it. And this is the word of God for the people of God. And may God add his blessings to the reading of his holy and inspired word. And all God's people together said, Amen. thank you. you. may be seated. The hot Israeli sun had drained him of almost every ounce of strength that he had. And he could feel the back of his neck getting redder and redder and redder from the sun by the moment. The only relief that he had came from the heat of a hot and sticky breeze blowing in the nearby sea. He was already tired of what he was doing and the day was just getting started. And the same thought started running through his mind that he thought each and every day when he found himself in this line of work. He said this, I will never amount to anything. I have to rent somebody else's property, farm that property, just to try to make ends meet. Then all of a sudden, the plow that he is using, it, it, it hits something in the dirt. And he knows what it is. Because half the time, he's having to remove these big rocks, these big boulders, in order for that plow to make that field ready for planting. He stops his oxen. He goes over to the plow and he picks the plow up out of the dirt. He goes to remove the rock and much to his surprise, it's not a rock at all. It's a box. And he opens the box. Inside that box is jewelry that is worth a fortune. And he shuts the box just right after he looks at it. He looks around to see if anybody has noticed what has happened. He knows what the Talmud says. Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And he starts thinking, 
What can I do to keep this treasure? Because the treasure goes with the land. And all of a sudden, he has this epiphany, if you will. I I know what I'll do. I'll buy this land. So he buries the treasure again. And he goes home to his wife and he says, gather all of your jewelry. Give me the candlesticks that we have. Anything that's worth any type of money, give it to me so I can go pawn it off to get cash. And his wife looks at him and says, have you lost your ever-loving mind? He says, just trust me. He understands that he's still short of money. And he goes to a dear friend of his and asks for a loan. And he says, if you'll just give me this amount of money, I promise you, I will pay you back tomorrow. Not next week, not next month, not next year. I'll pay you back tomorrow. And he goes and he purchases that land. And now... He is a wealthy man indeed. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like that. It's like a man who discovers a buried treasure. He quickly sells everything that he has in order to possess it. You see, burying treasure in that day and time was not unusual. It's not unusual today. I have known folks who have said, I don't trust the banks, I don't trust this institution. So they actually take their money, their savings account, and they will bury that money in their backyard. But back then, you didn't have banks with security boxes. You didn't have basements in your homes. You didn't even have an attic. In those days, you could be out working and you could hear or see an enemy army coming your way. So what you would naturally do is you would take anything that had any type of worth, you would put it in a box, you would bury it, you would mark it, and hopefully you'd be able to retain it later on. But sometimes when these individuals were taken off into exile, somebody else would come behind them, plow a field, and discover the treasure that they had buried. The joy of that discovery Jesus said, gave the man a willingness to sell everything that he had in order to possess it. There's a second parable. It's a parable about a connoisseur of pearls, if you will. This man goes down to the market and and there before him is an individual selling pearls. And, And he sees a pearl of great wealth of great worth and he asked the man how much do you want for this pearl he gives him a price and the price is well below what that pearl is worth as a matter of fact the man selling the pearl doesn't know much about pearls at all because if he did he would have the price jacked up and so to try to be a little coy and not to show so much excitement he just says to the merchant well would you do me a favor would you give me the right of first refusal on this pearl Well, sure I will. He goes home, Scripture says, sells everything that he has. He goes and buys the pearl. And he, as well, is a wealthy man. Jesus said this, listen, that the kingdom of God is like that. That an individual is willing to sell Everything that they have in order for the sheer joy of having it. So you have your outline this morning. Let me give you just a few points from these two parables that will help us to understand what God doesn't want us to miss this morning. In looking at these two parables, let me say this. The kingdom of God is worth whatever it may cost or whatever it may be a risk in your life. It's worth whatever it will cost you. Those of us who are a part of the kingdom of God experience an inner joy that comes with following Christ, which comes from His presence. And here is the thing that is driving me absolutely nuts this day and time. Christians are continuing to live a defeated life. 
We are living life like the pagans live their lives. But when you and I link our lives to Christ, there is an inner joy and an inner peace that comes with that. That understands that we are never, ever, ever going to be left alone. God didn't come into your life to be a burden. God didn't come into your life to be a cosmic killjoy. But rather, he came into your life to give you an inner joy. Do you remember the night that Jesus was born? The angel said, we bring you good tidings of great what? Joy. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. We experience a joy when we have him present in our life. And here's the promise that he gives us. Nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Folks, let me tell you something. If you don't have joy in your life, I would wonder if you have Christ in your life. I mean, think about that. No joy? Do you have Christ? Lloyd John Ogilvie was the Senate chaplain for many years in Washington, D.C. Some of you have heard of him. Some of you have read some of his writings. But he said he had a friend that whenever he would see him, they would talk And then as they were parting one another's company, they would shake hands and that friend would hold on to John Lloyd Ogilvie's hand a little bit tighter. And he would say this, Lloyd John, whatever you do, don't miss the joy in life. And there are a lot of folks here today, you've lost your joy. You haven't lost your salvation, but you've lost your joy. You're missing the penetrating power that comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And because of that relationship, he gives us the strength and the assurance to face difficult days. Whatever is going to happen tomorrow, rest assured, God is already in tomorrow. These two parables tell us about two people who were willing to sell everything that they had. In order to have that joy. What about you this morning? Are you joyful? I mean, is there an inner peace in your life? I I love the comic strip Peanuts. It is the first day of school. And Peppermint Patty walks into her classroom. And this is what she says to her friend Marcy. Ah, Marcy. Here it is. All before us. The first day of school. This is what it's all about. The excitement of learning. This year is going to be different. And in the last frame, Peppermint Patty has her head on the desk and she's sound asleep. And Marcy says, that's not too bad. The excitement of learning lasted an entire 14 seconds. There are a lot of us, listen closely. There are a lot of people who haven't had a lasting joy in their faith. We get excited for a moment. We get excited if the music stirs us or if the pastor says one word that might help us through the day. But when the worries of the world start coming our way, our joy quickly fades. We used to sing, I've got the joy, 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 where? Down in my heart. Some of you need to dig down a little deeper and find it. Don't miss the joy Christ brings to a life. Second, these people were willing to sell everything that they had because they believed the treasure had immeasurable value. As I look at the congregation today, last week, and over the last year and a half, there are a lot of people who are not convinced that the kingdom of God has that type of worth. You know why? 
Not much commitment. Not much commitment. We'll come if, if our schedules will allow. But don't let it become difficult and hard. Most folks today want an easy religion. They want an easy religion. We, 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 we want to get by and just kind of skim our way into heaven. But the call today challenges us to see the kingdom of God as one that has value and adds meaning to a life. The kingdom of God gives you a direction and it gives you purpose. The kingdom of God gives you hope in your life. The kingdom of God should enrich every relationship that you have. The kingdom of God brings fullness into one's heart, into one's life. No longer do you and I face dead-end streets. Christ gives us a new direction. He opens up new paths and he opens up new doors. And a lot of us are, are thinking this morning, I feel like I'm missing it. I just don't have it. And that feeling is passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. You see, today as Christians, we have missed the mark. We fumbled the ball because you and I have settled for less. We have nobody to blame but ourselves. We have brought false gods into our homes and we have bowed down to them because we have turned to materialism. We try to find happiness and joy in the things of this world and it'll never take place. You will never have joy based on the things of this world. People are longing for something. Why do you think that so many athletes, so many actors, so many prominent individuals, the elite of society, why do you think they're always going from one thing to the next? Because they were wired that way. You're wired that way. You are wired in such a way that there is a longing for something that you don't have. God created you that way. The sad part is these actors, these celebrities, these athletes, these politicians, they're wanting more security. They're, they're wanting more safety. They, they want some type of assurance. They, they, they want to know what the meaning of life. They want hope. And they feel just as hollow today as they did 10 years ago. I guarantee it you did this or you know somebody who did this in grade school. Because I'm not alone in this. I'm just transparent with mine. Did you ever pass a note to somebody in your class when you were in elementary school? Did the note go to a member of the opposite sex? Was it to a little girl? Maybe a little boy? Did you write the following? I love you if you love me. Yes or no? Circle one. You ever do that? Many of us ask the same question to God. Do you love me? Yes or no? And he answers yes every time. Every time. We're looking for affirmation from our parents. We're looking for affirmation from our children. We're looking for affirmation from our spouse. We want some type of hope. And the good news today is Christ comes and offers us direction, purpose, and meaning. And we begin to see the possibilities of what life is all about. Third, the kingdom of God wants to come into your life, but you have to be willing to receive it. The kingdom of God desires to come into your life, but, but you have to be willing to receive it. 
It's the greatest treasure of all. And yet, so many people walk past it and never even notice it. I told you this story. Some of you have heard it. Some of you haven't. When I went to First Baptist Church of Canton, we went in the month of November. We moved November the 1st, and we were there for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Mississippi State and Ole Miss are playing a football game at Davis Wade Stadium, and, and one of my deacons, actually the chairman of the search committee, asked me if I wanted to go with him to the game. Bring my family along with me. We'll go to the Mississippi State Ole Miss game. I hadn't been to an Egg Bowl in a while because I'd been in Kentucky for about the last five years. And so you go to that game, and I was all, so excited. I get to see my team play, and at halftime, my friend says to me, he said, uh, Preacher, you want to go get something at the uh, concession stand? Sure, let me go get a Diet Coke, go get some popcorn, some peanuts, or something like that. And as we were coming back to our seat, there was this, what I would call a centric looking man in his early 40s, possibly, possibly. Hadn't shaved in about two or three days, had a long trench coat on. And my friend, Bucky Murphy, knew this man, and, and he said, John, how you doing? He said, Bucky, I'm doing great. Pretty good ball game. Yeah, great game. And Bucky says, John, I want you to meet our new preacher. I said, John, Bill Hurt. And he said, John Grisham, nice to meet you. Okay. Here's where I just go blatantly stupid. We're talking, and I say, John, what do you do for a living? Now, you got you to gotta remember now, it's about 1991. The firm was just out. He had already done A Time to Kill. And uh, I hadn't read either one of them. Y'all, I was trying to get through seminary during part of that time. John, what do you do for a living? He goes, well, I'm a writer. And I was like, good luck with all of that. <laughs> and we walk away. And my friend Bucky looks at me and goes, son, you, son, you don't know who that is, do you? I said, yes, John Grisham. No, that's the John Grisham. Oh, I think my wife was reading one of his books. And you get back and you go, I was right by greatness. Maybe the most popular author in the United States. And I didn't realize it. But you're sitting in the presence of Almighty God today. And you're not even understanding it. You're wondering if he's here. This drives me crazy. Is when we pray. Before a service. God be with us today. You don't have to invite him in. He's already said he will be here. Where two or more are gathered. So many times we're standing on top of the treasure and we don't even know it. I read a story about a poor man that needed kind of a, a hand up. Not a hand out, but a hand up. And a very wealthy landowner came to him and said, look, I want to help you. And this is what the deal I'll offer you. You can go on my land and you can cut as much timber and sell it as you want. The guy looked at him and said, I can cut as much as I want. Yep. Take as long as you want. Cut as much as you want, sell it, I think it'll do, do you well. And he said, well, can I ask you this question? Will you help me cut it? Will you help me load it? To which the landowner said, no. You can get whatever you want, but you have to be willing to receive it for yourself. Some of us receive the love of God by accident like this man plowing a field. We weren't really searching for it, and it just kind of came into our lives. Some of us are like the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. I believe the Apostle Paul's life was fertile ground because he had just witnessed the stoning of Stephen. And I would imagine that as Paul is walking down the Damascus Road, he is thinking, why would a man like Stephen be willing to die for something that's false? And then God came, 
stopped him, blinded him by light, and he called Saul or Paul into the full-time missionary work. Today, whatever you're searching for in life, in life, understand the only thing that really matters is finding Christ. You find Christ and you'll be surprised how things start working out. Fourth, finding the treasure challenged these men to a higher vision. They were willing to sell everything that they had based on what we could or what they could be. You see, God calls you to be more than what you are today. That is a mandate from our Lord and Savior. If you are not more today, growing more today, then you are regressing in the Christian faith. There is no middle ground. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. God doesn't call us just to run the race. He calls us to finish the race. This race that is mapped out before us. I used to love to watch the children's one, one mile fun run when there would be a 10K race or a 5K race. They would have these children from first grade all the way up to six. And they would, you know, shoot the gun off to start them. And you would think they were doing a 50 yard dash. Those little children start running so fast. And then by about a quarter of a mile, not a mile, but about a quarter of a mile. They start stopping because they burned out. They have trouble finishing the race. Goals and dreams and visions, they lead us beyond where we are right now. Our aspirations can become realities. Christ has called us to be the best and the highest that we can be. Robert Browning said this, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what is a heaven for? You and I have to distinguish between the artificial and the real. We got to distinguish between the actual and the practical, the extraordinary from the ordinary. God expects for you to be extraordinary in your faith. He wants us to do more, achieve more, be a part of more. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. But we want all these things added unto us before we seek the kingdom of God. Four, fifth. These men were called to make a decision. They had to sacrifice everything that they had. And that price seemed outrageous. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler? Who came to see Jesus. You remember that story? He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know what the commandments are. And he says, I've kept those since my youth. Then he said, go and sell everything that he had. Give it to the poor. And then you can come follow me. Remember what scripture said about him? He went away what? Sad. Because he was a man of great wealth. Now. I've had folks that have tried to suggest this to me. Jesus was really just testing him. Why? He wasn't going to make him sell everything. No, I believe Jesus wanted to sell everything. Do you know why? His money, possessions, those were his God. Where your treasures are, there will your heart be as well. Everybody's got a God. You do. May not be Jehovah God. Maybe money. Possessions. And we're thinking the price is too steep. Like these men, we have to do more than just look at the treasure. We've got to do more than just talk about it. You have to possess the treasure. You have to be willing to sacrifice everything to get it. And all too often, we individuals in the church settle from less we go through the motions and pretend 
The sad part is we get caught on so many side roads, we're not even on the main thoroughfare of Christianity. The paradox of the Christian faith is the grace of God is free, but it will cost you everything that you have. We're fixing to land this plane, but I want you to lean in for a moment. I want you to lean in because I want to share something with you. Something that I believe, and it may offend you, so be it. We are a group of what I would say well-respected, decent people. Do you agree with that? I believe that. Th this church is something special. Something special about this place. We're decent and respectable people. Come in. Come on. But rarely does Christ come first. Rarely. School comes first. Work comes first. Pleasure comes first. Athletics come first. Let me tell you something. You stand before God, he could care less how many national championships your college team has won. Now, he might be impressed with the one we won in baseball. And you see that with each passing generation, it's getting worse, isn't it? Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. But this is what so many of us want. We want cheap grace. You know what cheap grace is? It's forgiveness with no repentance. Cheap grace is salvation with no cross. Cheap grace is church membership with no commitment. Cheap grace is baptism without confession. Cheap grace is communion without any fellowship. Folks, we got to stop relying on a Kmart blue light special religion because when the times get tough, that religion will not sell. It will not make a difference. You have to be willing. You have to be willing. You have to be willing to give away everything that you have and everything that you are in order to be a part of the kingdom of God. But when you find it, you find joy. I love the end of that video we watched today. And I was so surprised that you could sit there and not do nothing. Because he says, ain't nobody going to steal my joy. You've already allowed it. Some of you have already allowed it. And there's no anticipation. There's no excitement. And we're wondering, what's the difference? It's always the presence of Christ. What are you willing to give up today? Do you think it's worth it? It's worth everything that you have, everything that you are, and everything that you will ever be. Pray with me. Father, we thank you today for the joy that comes in finding your presence. So many of us want a religion with no responsibility. We want a religion with no strings attached. But that's not the Christian faith. We pray today, Heavenly Father, that you would entreat us to walk closer to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us the desire. Give us the desire, Heavenly Father, to go deeper and launch deeper. We can see what the world is doing, but we're in this world, and, but not of it. Remind us of the greatness of your love. In your son's name we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to have our hymn of invitation sung. And we'll give you an opportunity to make a decision for Christ. Maybe you give your heart to Christ. Maybe you come rededicating your life or transferring a church membership. Any decision that you feel the Lord asking you to make. Maybe you've drifted away. You just need to come on home. 
Maybe you need to come to the altar and pray. As long as an individual has a breath, you're not too far from God. We're going to sing that, or Jane's going to sing that old beautiful George Beverly Shea song. I'd rather have silver, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. George Beverly Shea said, you know, they tried to make something big out of that song, and all I wanted to do was tell them how much I love my Lord. Today, you have an opportunity to respond as well. You sit, you pray. The person on your right, the person on your left, they need your prayers. Pray as our ministers down front, we have our hymn of invitation. Right. 